excited to have Sally here with us. Tell us more about to bring Agile to HR. Thank you guys for being here. So welcome. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you. This is uh, normally not the crowd I talk to, but I feel like this is where I belong. It's really hard for me to explain that. Um, for many years, we've been working with IT leaders, uh, leading major organizations and major transformation for their IT department. And um, one of the CIOs that I was working with, do you guys know Susan Courtney at all? CIO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Nebraska. I think she's the CEO of another company now, CoreLink. But one time she sat, she kind of took me on the side and, and said, do you know that what you're doing is organizational transformation? And, and do you know that OD is really what you're doing and that's your passion? And I said, really? I, I, I thought this was IT. She's like, no, 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 dear. Everything we're doing here is major organizational transformation. So uh, what's unique about this experience today is I actually feel at home. Uh, for the first time, because I'm talking to people that understand what we're trying to do. So my objective and my, my hope what you get out of this is, um, first of all, how many of you ha know what Agile is? Okay. Are your companies doing Agile? Attempting to? Starting in the middle? Okay. This is less um, about Agile in IT, and it's going to be how can you begin to understand enough about Agile that you can even apply it within HR? Because I honestly believe that once you understand the principles of Agile and agility, right, and how do I not see this as a methodology that the IT department's using, but it's just a way of managing work. You all have work to do? Do you guys have a big to-do list? Yeah? Uh, do you believe that work should be done in teams? Do you believe that work should be visible, should be measurable? Yes. You guys heard today about clarity? You also heard today about focus? That is the heart of, of Agile. So um, I'm really hoping that by the end of this 90, the 90 minute session that you take something concrete that you can go apply within your HR team. Um, if not, I hope you get away an understanding of why is that other IT department or these other departments moving and changing what they're doing today, because quite frankly, they're trying to respond to real demands from the market. So that's, um, that's the journey. Uh, now, a little bit about me. Let me start with my three amazing children. I'm a very busy mother, uh, and I have Noor, who is uh, five years old, Yara is 10, and Sharif is about five now. Um, and I'm just a really busy mother, but I've, I started this passion uh, my company about in 2009, and it was really organizational transformation. How can I help individuals, teams, and companies change the DNA of how they work? And I really mean change the DNA of how they work. I'm not talking about making small, minor adjustments. Um, so a lot of companies that work with us have to have the courage to make the transformations that could, um, could be impacted by Agile. Um, I've been an Agile thought leader for a while now. I have lots of videos online, agilevideos.com. I do a lot of uh, webinars for projectmanagement.com. Um, and it's really interesting because Agile has started to transcend one role. It's not just a project manager thing. It's not just an IT thing. It's become um, like Lean. Have you heard of Lean? Do you guys use Lean? What, is, what do you know about Lean? Lean is measurable. It's really process optimization, right? When Lean was born, it was only supposed to be applied to manufacturing um, in a Toyota plant. But then as we understood more about Lean, you know what we realized? It can apply everywhere. If you guys have a process right now, a business process within HR, um, a sales process, uh, a marketing process, but it's so thick and it's not getting done very effectively, you can do value stream mapping to cut down and find all of the waste. It's what's happening to Agile. Agile was born through IT as a way of managing work and managing projects, and now it's transcending and saying, look, it's just a way to manage work. So that's been my passion, organizational transformation, and um, a big part of it has been servant leadership. So you'll see that I have lots of workshops, and any company that we do this with, we begin to shift the leadership style into more servant leaders, more empowering leaders, as opposed to the traditional old school command and control directive, I tell you what to do and you do it as I say. That doesn't work for highly innovative teams anymore. Um, so here's what we're gonna talk about. Drivers for change. Why is this happening? Why are, your, why are your own customers internally and what could cause you to also need to change? What is agile and, and, and why? What's the benefit? 
And then I'm gonna really have you work today. I really hope you're okay with that mentally. I'm gonna have you sort of roll up your sleeve and that's why you've got the sticky notes. I want you to apply it. I want you to really have fun um, and feel like you've gotten something out of here where you can apply it and take it there. And then I'm gonna have you commit at the end to just one or two things that you really will go back and leverage within your team, like truly a verbal commitment from all of you. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. So here's the first task you guys have as a team. I want you to think about what are the top challenges that face HR um, in terms of meeting your organizational needs. So maybe internal problems to HR, like what you just said, we're moving so fast, there's so much demand. Um, if you struggle with that, I also want you to think about what are your customers challenged with? Why do they need to change? Why is organizational transformation becoming something that's needed across various organizations? So whether it's within HR or within IT or within the business or sales and marketing, something's happening that's causing the need to change the way that we used to work before. Have a quick conversation as a team. Um, if you don't mind, uh, just jot them down. Uh, pick somebody to be a facilitator and go ahead and write them down on the flip charts. Just going to give you about four minutes for this workshop and get started now. So let's, let's go ahead and start reviewing. I'm sure we will probably have some similar ideas. Um, which team wants to go first? You guys will go first? All right. Are you guys okay to start? All right. We'll have this team go first, then we'll go to you, and then we'll come back to this team. Go ahead. Do you want me to just recite what's on there? Yeah. What did you guys talk about? What are the organizational challenges that are forcing change today, whether at HR, within the HR department, or whether just within your other customer groups? Excellent. Excellent. So are there drivers for change? There's many drivers for change. I'm going to read you just a few of the ones that a lot of the executives share with me and the companies share with me. And I think you've already mentioned many of them. Large backlog of work not getting done. Lack of predictability. Missing deadlines, losing customer focus. Constantly changing business priorities. Silos, handoffs, lack of trust and communication between the various departments, even within. So think of IT. There's different departments within IT. They don't get along with each other or talk to each other. Uh, within uh, marketing and sales, they don't. You know, they kind of do their own thing and they don't um, come together. Slow time to market would be one of the biggest ones. Customers are no longer willing to wait. Disruptors are emerging. You have to deliver faster. That's what they're expecting. No focus. This one's one of my uh, favorite ones. Multitasking. Multitasking means our, our thought or our assumption that starting so many projects all at the same time actually gets them done faster. Do you guys know like that's the biggest facade? And I wish we had more time today. There's a wonderful multitasking game that I could have played to show you that. And I play it with many executives because they're the ones that have shining ideas. And they're the ones that ask everybody in the organization to start, 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 not realizing or counting, finish. So from a metric perspective, we like to count how many projects did we deliver and finish per quarter as a, and how many did we start and make sure that our, what we call our whip, our work in progress is efficient. No strategic alignment, lack of capacity measurement, dysfunctional meetings, um, quality and rework issues. This is sort of the, the almost the backlog of uh, needs and drivers for change. Is this relevant to your organization? Right? Do you guys see some of it? That's, that's within yours. Um, why Agile? So I have a fun little video here. I'm going to play quickly. <laughs> so um, the point here is we're working very hard on the wrong items from a customer perspective. We're working very hard. We're very busy. See that word that we talked about, busyness? but it might not be the right stuff or it might not be the most important thing to work on. Do you guys notice that? That's, so it's not that everything we're doing is invaluable, it's not the most important. And in Agile, the idea of what's the most valuable, most important thing we should focus on right now is a constant question that we ask almost every day. So what ultimately, what organizations are moving from, and this is potentially a reorganization, a redesign of companies. Companies that I work with, we're actually doing that. We're in that we don't start there because we don't want to shock the system. But we're moving away from the design of siloed functional teams that hand off work to each other. So a group of analysts, a group of developers, a group of engineers, a group of project managers, they do their work and they hand off the work to each other. That's the main way of communication. 
to building cross-functional teams as the core and nucleus of the organization. And you probably have heard of them. I mean, sometimes they used to refer to them as project teams. But project teams traditionally are brought together and then they're destroyed after the project is done. Are you guys familiar with that, right? They're brought together, destroyed. We are now talking about stable teams. Cross-functional teams that stay together, you just change their backlog. You change their work. You change what they're working on. Once they're done with a deliverable, then they work on the next deliverable and the next deliverable. And all of their deliverables are broken down into quarterly chunks of work and, and smaller. Right? So we're no longer doing multi-year initiatives. Even those are broken down into, in the next three months, what are we going to deliver and how do we take that elephant and even break it down to two-week increments? What do you think is the advantage of that? Keeping teams together, keeping them stable, as opposed to pulling them apart constantly and having them work this way. Just, you guys are from HR, so this, there's some big ahas here that are starting to happen to leaders. Don't need to start over every time, right? What else? Same building on the trust. It's important. Yep. You're actually building relationships. I had one gal who was in a functional team before, and I was trying to repair a problem that she had with a tester on the team. And she says, Sally, I just don't know why you're working so hard on trying to make us get along. This is not my real team. My real team is my BA team, my analyst group. I don't, this is not my real team, this project's gonna be done in a few months and I don't have to get along with him. And then I went back home and I thought about it, I'm like, wow, isn't that amazing? We have invested so much building high-performing functional teams, even though they actually don't add any direct value to the customer, yet put what I would say task managers, like project managers, over cross-functional teams who are truly the nucleus of an organization. So, what is Agile? It's a way of thinking. If all you know about Agile are the practices, the daily stand-up meetings, the sticky notes, all of that, which we will be doing some of that, then we're not getting the spirit of what Agile is about. It's a new way of thinking. It basically says when we solve problems, we're going to solve it collaboratively. We are going to adapt to customer needs as opposed to push back and say, we have no time, we have no capacity, and you can't change your mind. We shift into saying, no, we accept, we understand. OK, can we do it in our next sprint? Let's figure out how do we adapt to that need. Delivering value by business priority. So instead of everything being high priority, we say, but what's the highest? <laughs> and we actually say, I don't even want to know what's high, medium, low anymore. I want to know them in a ranked order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So from Agile, we don't prioritize high, medium, low. We rank. Rank the backlog. Customer first. Everything is driven around what does the customer want and what do they need and are we meeting their expectation as opposed to relying heavier on process and documentation and following that. It does value people over process, so that's the shock factor. I'm trying to explain to you why some of your companies are going to struggle with this. Is companies that were very process and governance oriented, red tape, procedures, documentations, forms, manuals, before you can get anything done you have to go through all of that. Agile shocks that system because it says but people collaborating, talking to each other, sitting with each other is more important than just having heavy processes. Why can't we co-locate people and sit them together so they can have the right conversation? So that's where the, the, the facilities department gets their first shock, which is, oh, what are you saying? I don't want to change all my cube structures. I don't want to put people in open spaces and put them together. Uh, that's not what we've done for many years. But that's the first shock, right? Second, deliver business value early and often. So no longer will you as a customer wait six months for me to get the project done and then show you. You actually now have to engage with me. Have any of you built a house? Raise your hand if you built a home. How often did you go down and look at the house while it was being built? Be honest. Sometimes daily. Daily. Multiple times. Why? I want to see progress. What you just said is a role that we have identified in Agile now called a product owner. The product owner role in Agile is the customer from inside the business or externally, but most of them are inside the business, that is willing to come and look at the house every single day, every couple times, two, three times per week to make sure it's going to meet their expectation as opposed to traditionally the customer, or even your customer, they give you an idea, you go off and do it, and then maybe three months later, or six months later, you show them result when the house is done. We would have never hired that builder if we only got to see the house when it was completed to provide feedback. 
Promote, expedites return on investment, promotes business engagement. This is a shock to the business team. So the business product owners will say, I don't have time for this, I already have a full-time job, right? Your customers, your customers, or if IT is doing this, if you're the customer of IT, you'll say, but I already have a full-time job. I cannot engage in this way, but it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary for any customer who we're building the house for to come and look at the house and give us feedback. For years, we didn't do it that way. Adapts to change and develops integrated and then high performance. So this is the spirit, the spirit of Agile. Um, does it work? Does it not work? I say the only real testament is if a CEO and the CFO of your company can talk about it and say that it works. I don't even care that it's the CIO or the, the head of HR. I think that ultimately an organizational transformation succeeds when the topmost executives feel it, know it, and it's measurable. So for Blue Cross of Nebraska, Agile has a significant ROI. We've seen 30% bottom line improvement. And the CEO said, we have doubled our throughput and capacity of work without rework. So quality has improved while they've doubled the amount of work that they're doing. And of course, there's more stories here. So I've always talked about our four pillars. What does organizational transformation mean? And what's the ultimate goal from this transformation? Four things. This is very important. Because honestly, like when we talk about an organizational transformation, we define it with those. Clarity. And I love that they just, someone just set me up for success there. They just talked about clarity. And they talked about focus. That was awesome. Clarity on what, why do we exist as an organization? And why do I exist at the team? And how should we behave, our core values and norms, so that they're explicit, not implicit? And what is the most important thing I should focus on right now? Who are we? How should we behave? And what's important right now? Those three questions being answered at the individual level, at the team level, at the program level, at the portfolio, and at the leadership level. Focus. Can we finish what we started without distraction? So you'll see in Agile, we have a lot of rules that say, hey, customer, you came in and you want to change something. Let's say you're, um, you're an HR team and one of your customers says something for you. You'll basically say, no problem, but in the following sprint. The current sprint, we've already planned it. We're already executing. Let us finish what we started. You can change your mind in the next sprint, the next two weeks. Execution. Predictable execution means can we all throughout the entire organization execute in a predictable way so that you know what a product owner means, you know what it means to have a backlog, you know what a two-week sprint means, and we don't have to translate that. And then in the middle is a healthy culture. So this is the process transformation that's required, and in the center is the cultural transformation that's required. Those are the four elements of a transformation. Have you guys read the book of The Advantage? Any of you by Patrick Lencioni? It is awesome. It is a really great book for a group of executives and leaders to come together and say, how do we bring organizational clarity at every level of the organization? It's, it's phenomenal. So, to give you the story of Agile applied to HR now, that's all I'm going to tell you about Agile before, is um, we helped transform one of the HR departments at Gap. You guys all shop at Gap? They applied Agile within HR, and I'm going to use their case study as you actually start um, applying it. And their website is agilehrsolutions.com. What I loved about them is they documented everything. Every sprint, every week, they put up a story of what they were doing how they were doing it, and what they were learning as an HR team. And the reason I wanted to show you this is so no one can say, well, this doesn't apply to HR. I still see it, but this only applies to IT. I wanted you to see how a real HR team in a very competitive Silicon Valley, this was in California, their problem was um, talent is being snatched from them le left and right. It's very competitive. It's like cutthroat there to keep the millennials and to attract new ones. And they had to come up in, uh, with a, what they called a one-day hire process and completely revamp the way that they were hiring from before. And they used Agile for that. This is the group of ladies um, that we're going to be talking about here. Let's get a couple more concepts out of the way. Two more slides on Agile, and then we'll start working. Because I do want you to get the terminology. And there is a cheat sheet. The colored item at the floor, that's the cheat sheet that I want you to take with you that has the words. I want you to definitely feel like you know what the words are. This is called a backlog. A backlog is the list of work you need to get done. A backlog is the list of work you need to accomplish. The team is the cross-functional team that is going to get the work done. And let me be very clear, it's cross-functional. 
Every person that you need from any department that will help you get this item to done is considered a team. So if you need a recruiter, if you need um, an internal HR analyst, if you need a data person, if, you, if, the, if it's those four people together need to work together daily to get this done, they're called the team. Not the recruiter team separately, and then this, the group of managers, I'm not talking, those are what we call functional teams, right? The product owner is who? Product owner is who? The customer. It's the person who said that this is important to them. The job of a product owner for a team is to own the backlog, tell the team what should they work on, why, and in what order. What should you work on, why, and in what order from a rank perspective. That's one of the most critical new roles that we have added. We found that teams are floundering, and their customers are like coming everywhere, through email, through texting, through drive-bys, and they have too many stakeholders that are asking them to do things. So we now say, you cannot actually talk to the team members directly. You have to go through the product owner. They'll prioritize the team's backlog. You had something back there? Yeah. Yep, it's such a critical new innovation, um, but it makes sense because all of these people used to talk to these people directly and talk about the lack of focus. The lack of focus we're talking about is there is no one way for a team to say, look, you're my, you know, you're my product owner. How do you want me to execute this backlog? So have you heard of the Scrum Master role in any of your Agile teams? Think of them as the Agile project manager. They are in charge of the process. Everything we're talking about here, the stand-up meetings, the product owner being healthy, everything is a process and we need someone to make sure the process is healthy. Remember, I think one of our speakers talked about courage. This person is going to have to have courage because you have to have courage to protect the team from disturbances. You have to have the courage to remove impediments and problems that are slowing down this team. Which means if you're a vice president and you come over and you want to talk to Jody and then have her pull her away so she can do something for you, I have to step in as a scrum master and say, hey, I totally understand what you're trying to do. I know that you have an urgent issue right now. Can I tell you how we are going to channel that? Because Jody's already working on something that she needs to finish, but let me help you with that. Let me tell you what another way that we can get that solved. That takes courage. Right? Because I'm not, I can't look at your title anymore. I have to protect the team and protect the process. Agile requires discipline at every level of a company. It's not something you can say, oh, let the team do Agile. No, executives need to follow the Agile rules as well. Because they're the ones that sometimes add the biggest chaos. All right, other things you should know. Every big project or all of the work that you ever want to get done, we break it into two-week sprints. A sprint is a fixed time box. It, starts, it can basically start on Monday and end the following Friday. What we do at the beginning of every sprint is we say, OK, which items are we going to get done in the next two weeks? Can we plan them out and break them down into tasks? Who's going to do what? So that's called our sprint planning meeting. Again, remember, this is very important. Every two weeks on Monday or whatever day your sprint starts, you're going to meet with your cross-functional team. It's normally a small team. And you're going to say, what are we hoping to accomplish by the end of the two weeks? and who is going to do what. Every day, every single day, this group of people meet together and have what we call the stand-up meeting. The stand-up meeting is where they answer three questions individually. I'll say, here's what I worked on yesterday, here's what I'm planning on completing today, and here's what's blocking me. I am stuck because I need something from you and I haven't got that answer. Or I am stuck because Adam in uh, IT was supposed to get me something and I didn't get it. Or, John, I'm waiting for you to finish what you're working on before I can get started. Every single day, 15 minutes, stand up. Is that a daily scrum team made up of all the scrum masters that are keeping the process healthy? Or is that a scrum leading a delivery team? So this happens at the team level and includes their scrum master. There's something that we have called Scrum of Scrum, which is when multiple teams are trying to work on a common program. And that's called the Scrum, and that's even one level above, which I'm not covering today. But yes, there's uh, now when I have multiple teams, four or five teams, all working on a multi-million dollar or larger initiative, how do we bring them together as a program team so we know that there's dependencies or cross-team issues? The end of the two weeks, what would you want to see? Show me results. This is where he says, show me some money. 
This is Tom Cruise, show me something done. You do need to, as a team, I don't care if it's a document, it could be software, it could be the flyer you guys promised, it could be the video you were producing, it could be the new manual you promised to get done, it could be the new policy, whatever it is, you need to show as a team that you got something to done. Does that make sense? And then you stop for a second and say, so how did the last two weeks go? And how are we going to improve the next two weeks? What you see here is the Agile process. And it repeats over and over and over again within every team, within every program, and even at the portfolio layer. We plan, we do daily inspection, we demo and show results, and then we do inspecting and adapting, which is the retrospective, and then we do it over again. So you do that at the portfolio level as well? Quarterly. Okay. Everything that I taught you here begins to kind of go up and then go up, and it becomes an enterprise cadence. So this is the team cadence every two weeks. A program cadence um, could be every three weeks or every once a month. And the portfolio level is every quarter. So we help organizations right now, executives, we do strategy plannings every quarter. We have them lay out their deliverables every two weeks um, or by month for that quarter. All the teams know what they're about to go work on. And this is, I would say, the biggest aha moment executives have had is when they go into a room, and we call this the ECC room, the Enterprise Command Center room. We actually got the idea from Nebraska and we started to implement it. On one wall is quarterly plan down to what deliverables do we expect to get done, even by month. On the, on the left side of the wall are the teams and their actual sprint plan. What are they delivering for this quarter and what do they have penciled in for the following quarter? It is the biggest, I would say, the most powerful visibility room you could ever create to transform your company. It's one of our, I would say, enterprise transformations patterns is creating an ECC room, an enterprise command center where your demand and your capacity of who's working on what is all visible. And no longer can an executive come in and say, well, I have a shining, bright, shiny idea, because if you want to go put it in a team's backlog, what do you have to do? You have to remove something, because you see it now. If you go into your companies today and say, who's working on what? Uh. I would highly doubt that anybody can answer that question. Okay? So you guys getting the idea? Yes. The retrospective is about the process? Yes. Okay. And the process or the team health. We could actually say, product owner, you're not showing up to all of our meetings. And what I've found, and that's why I'm just loving that we're working now and HR is, like they said, really, HR could lead this. Uh, because the biggest conversations that don't happen sometimes is become very process oriented, but not culture. John, you don't come in on time every day. Team accountability, no longer manager accountability, team level accountability happens in the retrospectives. You don't show up on time every day. You say you're gonna do something, but you don't get it done. That's my frustration right now. Very real conversations happen in retrospectives where manager holding me accountable becomes more of a traditional old school way, and team accountability is real, and it's, it happens in the retrospective. If they're healthy or not healthy? Yeah, I mean, culturally, that may not be, like when you're shifting or transitioning to this, yes. culturally, that might not be what it looks like immediately. Yeah, and it won't. Right. This is a transformation. Um, and one of the things we actually do when you first stand up a team is you do a baseline health assessment after you kind of train them on Agile and teach them. Um, the most important, this is, and you all have copies of it that you can grab, but this is what we call a team health radar. The team health radar tells me if this team is successful and healthy or if they're not. And what I love about it is we've added culture to it and leadership as well. If the team has clarity on what they're working on, why, in what order, and their roles, they should show performance. They should get stuff done with measurable metrics. They should have a healthy leadership team, including a manager that's empowering them as opposed to still micromanaging them, and including an engaged product owner. Remember that business person that we said should come and look at the house? The culture, the layer below the surface within the team, trust and respect, happiness, accountability needs to be there. And then finally, the basic foundation for agility, the stuff that we planning, estimating, daily stand-up meetings, all the stuff I'm teaching you is what we call the foundation. This is how we measure every quarter that this team is on track and then get them back on track again as a measurement. All right, so that's a lot about agile. Let's, uh, let's, let's play. All right, we've got 30 minutes, we can do this, we can do this. I want you to start thinking of an HR project. Um, 
I'm going to give you three samples that you could use, and I want you to create a vision. When I went to this team, you know, I could show you this picture for us, but really what's more intriguing about this picture is what's behind me. Their big idea was a one-day hiring. That was their idea. They, they said that today they take days, months to hire somebody. The process was convoluted, it's not competitive, and it does not match the Silicon Valley way of, of operating. So they wanted to kill the interview process. They wanted to say goodbye to old sacred cows, which they had a list of sacred cows uh, that were, were there. And I can't remember what this one was, but I wanted to show you what ideation looks like. Uh, what's an example of a sacred cow? Um, lengthy background checks. Uh, yeah, there, was, there were several of them. Yes, it took, that's what they just started brainstorming is these are the things that are causing so long and even the interview process, so this is more detail. Um, one day hiring is valuable to Gap because it is a huge competitive advantage. It creates a great candidate experience. It gets top talent in the door quickly and locks down um, higher quality candidates. The product features, so notice they're thinking of it as a product. It's not a software, but in their mindset, they're thinking about product development, lean startup, and applying it within HR. Kill the interview, goodbye to job descriptions, manager reference forms and resumes. I know that sounds probably like crazy, right? Recruiter 3.0, redefining roles and responsibilities. And their first release, notice they're using the same terminology, we're gonna release something. A release doesn't have to be software, here's what they're doing. Pre-interview job assessment, one day background screening and a coffee chat with the hiring manager. It's no longer called an interview. Here's what they said they're doing. There's no measurement of success to support the idea that more interviews, touch points, or time spent in the process leads to better quality candidates. We do know that we're losing top talent to competitors because we're too slow. We're focused on getting to know candidates swiftly and making decisions more informed in a timely way. Does this, is this relevant to you? Yeah. It's relevant, right? So, I want you to think, as a team, real quickly, come up on your flip chart with an idea, and it could be any one of those. It could be a one-stop job website. It's, you're going to reinvent how you're uh, finding and recruiting people on your website. It could be maybe a new agile performance management. It could be the talent development 3.0, or it could be what they just did. If you really like that idea that they had the one-day hiring, you could just steal that right along. Um, come up with a quick vision for me, just like they did a vision of what is it, which one of those projects, and what do you want it to look like? What's your big idea? Now, I wish I could give you a lot of time for this. I really normally would. But I want you to just play. It doesn't have to be perfect. Come up with an idea, and what does success look like from your perspective? <clears throat> a few minutes. Find a facilitator. Okay, so read us your big idea. We're going to go with this team first. What's the big idea? Um, so we talked about wanting it to be high value, free, uh, new employee orientation. So take a look at that and work it into what do we want succession planning to look like. Awesome. Really good job. Excellent. In order for a big idea to be a big idea, it needs to shock you a little bit, and you need to get a little bit uncomfortable with it. Like, oh, but we've done that for, the minute you catch yourself saying, but we've done that for so many years, you know you're starting to talk about the right idea, <laughs> right, when it feels uncomfortable. So um, I wanted to show you more. So for this specific um, team, what they said, having a big idea and a vision is great, but you need to have measures for success. Measures and metrics are critical. For example, current hiring process, apply, invite, screen, invite, screen, scheduling. Uh, this is the touch points, number of times we're touching the candidate. Um, and future hiring process, they want to apply, screen, invite, schedule, coffee chat, job offer, uh, with three times touching the candidate, maybe a fourth one if needed. Is that pretty clear? Right? It takes 10 to 54 days today to hire. We want to move it to 7 to 32 days. Um, 40 to 128 hours for actual working hours to get this done. We'd like to take it down to truly 4.5 hours. You need to start thinking just like Agile Teams, which is how are we going to measure success from this initiative, from this new product that we're building. 
Now we talk about in Agile the backlog, the story backlog, the work that it takes to get it done. I wanted to show you an example. This is what we call a deliverable or an epic. Provide training and education on Agile. And this is, this I, I took this from a backlog for an HR department who is part of an Agile transformation. And they said, so what's our role from an Agile perspective? And I said, well, here's kind of your backlog. This is the stuff you need to do. And so as the head of training, I want to gather training requirements from the various managers so I know what they're looking for. That's called a story. A user story, and so you hear that word a lot, a user story is, as a who, who's the user, who's the, who's the one requesting this, what do they want, and so that what, what's the value? The reason we write it that way is we always know who's the customer, what is it they're looking for, and what's the value. Another example, as the training department, we need to design an agile learning roadmap, which hint, hint, I've given you what ours looks like, uh, so that's another one of your handouts. Um, to cover all the key roles, what topic and skills they need so that we have an enterprise learning plan. Is that important? A roadmap. But notice the roadmap is very specific deliverable. Design team-based performance management. That's what you guys were talking about. As the HR department, we want to solicit input on the impact of current individual reward systems on agile teams. As an HR, do you guys see what we're doing now? We're taking the big elephant and we're breaking it down into what I call two-week chunks, two-week deliverables. Every item that's called a story has to be accomplished or completed within a two-week time frame or less. So it needs to be something I can finish this week or it might take me a couple weeks to get done, but no longer than that. That is what a story is. Did you guys write that down? Remember that. A story is something. Everything above a story for now, I don't want to get too technical, it's called an epic. An epic is something that's bigger than two weeks. Here's more example. Candidate matching questions was a deliverable, and they actually broke it down. Coffee chat is an epic, which they're going to break down. Expedited background screening was an epic that they're going to break down. Having a transparency tool is an epic that they were about to break down. As a hiring manager, I want the ability to review applications for hot jobs as they come in so that I can immediately reach out to my superstar candidates. As a hiring manager, I want the empowerment to make the hiring decision so that I can secure. This is an example of what they put as their backlogs as two-week deliverables. Do you understand? We take the big idea and we break it down into epics. Epics look like that. Coffee chat, tool, expedite screening, candidate matching. And then we take those epics and break them down into? User stories. User stories and each story has to be accomplished within? Two weeks. Two weeks or less. Here's a sample of what that HR team did to come up with user stories. They put on the wall, or they actually do it sometimes on the floor or on a flip chart. Here's the, the big epics, and then here are the stories underneath them that map to these epics. Can you play? Can you try? I want you to look at what you came up with and just take one thing that you think could be an epic. Let's just say it's the, um, Think of one deliverable, maybe what you would really start with. And the way to think about it is three months from now, three months from now, that's the best way. What would you like to see as completed, right? Three months from now, if you were really going to do that, what would show you that you've made progress? The whole project isn't going to be done in three months. But what's a great milestone epic that if you could accomplish in three months, even if it's just the process, even if it's, the, if it's one experiment of your new process, that would be your definition of done? So just talk about that first. Before you put anything out, just talk about it as a team. Three months from now, what could you deliver as an epic that would show that you've made progress towards this journey? Just conversation, nothing, nothing to write yet. Actually, do grab your post-it notes because you had a great idea. Write that idea on a post-it note. What else do you think could be a deliverable in three months? I lied. Write them on a post-it note. Whatever your three-month ideas are of deliverables, go ahead. Whoever had that idea, write it on a post-it note. Um, so do you want us to have the epic idea on a post-it note and then the post-it notes to be in steps of how the two-week deliverables are? You yeah, for now, I just even want you to think about what, what is a deliverable? Epics? What are the epics? Because we'll get to the stories, but even coming up with a, with a mark in the ground to say three months from now, I want to see this, in itself is a breakthrough. And then we'll say, all right, to get to that, what are the things we need to do every two weeks to get to that epic?
I'm going to take you deeper. Come back to me for a second. Do you guys get what an epic is now? An epic is something concrete that you want to happen. There could be two or three of them in the end of the quarter, three months from now. A story is something that you want to demo and show very concrete at the end of every two weeks. Do you guys understand that? A story is something that you want to demo and demonstrate. It could be the definition of high value. A task, because you're going to hear about tasks. Tasks are smaller things that you need to do to get you there, like scheduling of a meeting. Scheduling of a meeting is a task, because in itself, that does not add any value to me. The results of that meeting and the consensus that we came up with is really the output of the meeting. Do you guys understand that? Yes, that would be a task. Prep and design for the brainstorming session, that would be a task. Under the, um, the story would be as a, whoever my product owner is, as the business HR person, I want, you, I want to understand um, the, the clear definition of high value from our stakeholders so that we have a common understanding. Do you see the story? As the product owner, I want a clear definition of high value from our stakeholders so we have consensus. Scheduling the meeting, preparing for the meetings, you know, facilitating the meeting are all the, the busy work. We call it the busyness to get there. In Agile, we are 100% concrete on what's the valuable deliverable that I'm going to demo two weeks from now. So let me show you more examples, and then we'll, we'll uh, bring it. Um, we've got about another 10, 15 minutes. Release planning. Release planning, which is what I'm going to have you do now on your chart. In order for me to get to a quarter worth of work, how many sprints do I have? If, if every iteration or every sprint was two weeks, how many will I have? Six. So this is what Agile teams do. They say, if I want, let's say this was number six, I want to accomplish these epics here. Let's just actually put them outside of the sprints, right? Those three epics need to be here. What will I need to accomplish to get them done and to show progress? in two-week increments. So again, let's go back to that. You said that you're hoping that the high value, the, the complete understanding of high value, and you might decide that's not a three-month deliverable. That needs to happen here. Because if we don't understand here what high value is, then we're never going to get some of those deliverables. So in Agile, we take our backlog and our work, and we begin to slice it in order of dependency and priority so we can meet that quarterly goal. Do you see what we're talking about here? So this was my backlog. Before I can even execute on it, we sometimes have something called iteration zero, which is more of a research and design and proof of concept. It's like we're not even ready to roll, but we need two weeks just to figure out what the heck we even want to do. It's what we call iteration zero. It's the foundation. It's like that's when we design. We, we look at even alternative solutions. It's brainstorming. It's research. It's what could it even look like? We explore. But we have to still demo at the end of iteration zero what was the design? What was the big idea? What was the result of your research? And then we take these items that we said we need to get done and slice them and slice them into sprints to get them done. Does this make sense? I want to pause here for a second. I was going to have you actually do this, but I don't think we'll have time. I, I just want to stop here and say, does this make sense? Yes. Ideally, so I'm going to go to ideal world. If this project over here is actually worth doing, and it's a really high important, then of course, the more dedicated those individuals are to this project, the more likely the project will succeed. Now, I will argue that when you don't have dedicated people, it actually becomes a higher risk project, right? So more visibility, more transparency using this process will reduce the risk because if you don't pull those people, even if all you have for me, and this is what we always say, let's say you only have 30% dedication to my project. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take your 30% and I'm going to tell you every two weeks, the planning meeting, maybe one or two of the daily stand-ups, and the final demo, you will need to attend them. Even if you can't sit with me, if you can't be 100%, whatever your 30% is, whatever hours you're going to give me, I'm going to slice it for you into that planning meeting, into a couple of the stand-up meetings, and into the final demo. Because if I don't, you'll probably get defocused and start multitasking and not get your work done for my team. 
So Agile actually reduces the risk by having so much visibility. The team is planning every two weeks, they're standing up every day, and they're demoing. So if the team is not on track because they're multitasking, they will tell you about it in their first retrospective. When you do a retrospective and say, so why did we not get anything done in the last two weeks? They're going to say, because none of us are dedicated to it. I've been busy, you've been busy, you've been busy. So then all we say is, so what would you like to change in the next two weeks? Well, okay, maybe, maybe I actually will come to the planning meeting, or maybe I'll stop into the 15-minute meetings, or I'll call into it at least a couple of times. So now the team says, okay, great. That's a great improvement for the next sprint. Does that answer? Yeah, and think, it's completely remove IT out now. Let's just even forget about IT and what they do. And let's just think about even within HR, if we had these initiatives that you guys are talking about, would there be value for us every two weeks? First of all, would it be value for us coming up with a stake in the ground of what we think we want to have done in X number of months from now? Would there be any value in breaking that work into two-week chunks? And would there be any value to having the team, whether they're full-time or dedicated or not dedicated, get together to talk about these items and actually show results? So again, forget about IT and what they're doing. I really want you to clear your mind of how IT operates today. The idea behind Agile is let's take a big elephant that we've agreed to accomplish, let's break it down into small chunks, and let's have lots of visibility and conversation every day around are we meeting it, are we not meeting our expectations? Yes? We break everything down into smaller teams, smaller teams that get work that roll up into a larger team. So distributed teams are using Agile very successfully today. Um, every Agile team is seven plus or minus two. So let me kind of clarify that to you. A team is never 50 people. A team, what we found best practices is seven plus or minus two is the right size of a high performing team. So we begin to create backlogs and deliverables and then give them to that seven plus or minus two. And what we might realize is this team, this team, and this team, those HR teams, all are working on a common overall performance management initiative. And so they need to meet as what we call a program three times a week and do what we call a scrum of scrum. So the teams are going to operate in their two-week sprint at the team level, but two to three times per week, we're going to have a virtual scrum of scrum and say, how are all of the teams doing? What are the dependencies? What's your progress? What's blocking you? How can we, we call the program team, help you or support you? We want visibility into what you're doing. So Agile takes distributed teams and breaks them down into smaller teams and then creates what we call a program layer above them as a way of bringing transparency across those teams. All right, let me tell you about the culture and then let's bring it to completion. We talked about the product owner, the Scrum Master, we also, and I don't want to make sure that I didn't forget this for you, is there's a solution lead. Every team needs the business person to tell them what, why, and in what order. Do you guys remember those three things? What do you work, what do you do for me? Why and in what order? The Scrum Master is in charge of the process. If you don't like the word Scrum Master, call him the team facilitator, right? Call him the team facilitator. The solution lead is the person or people on the team that know how to get the work done. If there's no expert that knows anything about this, then we sometimes fumble for a little bit. But sometimes we do need someone on the team that has some expertise that gives us the how, unless it's an innovation project. An innovation big idea means we all don't know the how and we're all about to experiment totally fine, and then that's acceptable. But if we're about to replace an existing system, or migrate, or do something like that, we do need someone that knows the how. Would that be like, from a technology standpoint, to be like an application expert? Architect, a technical okay. lead, okay. yep, okay. yep. Um, this is a cross-functional team, they have a backlog, and then every two weeks, as the team executes, we have them measure how much. Think of it, how many items did you actually get to done? Not done, but. Done, but means that, well, we scheduled the meeting and we had it on the uh, high value definition. 
but you say, but we didn't capture the notes and we don't have final consensus. That means that story is not done. That means that story was not accomplished because having the meeting wasn't valuable. It was the end result that was valuable. The only thing we measure every two weeks is what was done, done, not done, but. Um, agile teams, because they work so close to each other, come up with what we call norms, culture. We support and respect one another. Putting our team first as we work in a fun and nimble way. We prioritize our team dynamic and encourage direct and respectful commentary. <coughs> this is a core value. What we're used to today is company core values. Well, in Agile, we have team core values and norms. We take these company core values, or I mean, it, of course, all of us have to adhere to the company core values, but every team explicitly defines what are their norms, what are their working agreements. Yes, they will, and they should. Ray should, whatever is important, this is what, what he said, the, sometimes the unspoken rules. We don't have unspoken rules. We speak and we write down very visibly the team norms. What's expected of us? How do we behave? We have in our own company. So we talk about negative, um, call it like uh, planting weeds. We are 100% as a team against people talking to each other and planting a negative weed about somebody else on the team. That that has become an unaccepted behavior, so we make it explicit. We do not plant weeds about each other. We plant seeds. So it's, when you make it real, they'll live it. When you make it fake, they won't. So it has to be theirs. So what's the manager's role in holding those teams accountable? I heard you say team accountability, but what happens if you've got someone on the team who's not? Coaching busy? and growth. Coaching. The manager's role shifts to three things, and you'll see it in the radar with the manager. We do not want you to do task management anymore. We don't want you to do firefighting every day and be reactive. We want managers to become strategic and do the following three things. Be servant leaders, so move away from the command and control directive. We want you to coach and grow the individuals on the team, so people development and coaching. And then the third thing is process improvement. Managers have been so in the weeds, firefighting every day, that they have not spent time improving processes, making things better, removing what I call organizational impediments that have impeded this team for so long because they're the ones that have said, well, this is how we've been doing it. I want that to completely be shuffled. We can manage our work now. So what you should focus on is growing the individuals and improving the process. This is a very, I would say the manager role is yeah. the biggest shift and shock that your system will have if you're not prepared for it from an Agile perspective. Stand-up meetings, collaboration, walls. You're going to start seeing sticky notes and walls. Have you already seen this in some places? It's all about visual tracking and visible tracking. Some teams like to use electronic tracking, which looks like this. Um, you can use this at home. I have, you know, it's really, honestly, it's what do we want to do every week? Those are the chores. Um, and, and they take them week by week, and we use it, we know there's actually a whole website called Agile for Families. Agile is just a way of managing work and then giving a reward system for the team or for your kids when they accomplish that amazing goal. I did it with my daughter. I actually had them brainstorm what big rewards they wanted and what small rewards. And I told them as long as they got five stories done, five points, they would get a big, a small reward, and if they accumulated it to 10, they would get a big reward. And that just stuck with them. It was a visible board. She had to do her chores. She was counting points every time she got something done. When you get five points done, you can pull a small reward, like having a play date or um, you know, going with me to the store and, and getting maybe some, some candy or something like that. And then a big reward was spending a day with me and going to the zoo, for example, was something that she wanted. But I want you to remember what I'm just saying, because reward systems could change in the future. What I just told you I did with my daughter is I had her come up with what would be considered a big reward and what would be considered a small reward, and how does she want to earn it. And it's way beyond my talk today, but Agile Performance Management, we actually invented something called the Earned Reward System that um, if any of you guys are interested, you know, contacted me and we'll talk about it. We're piloting it. But it's a new way of rewarding. That's it. Please continue to learn on agilevideos.com. We have the largest library in the world, even though we're right here in Omaha. It's agilevideos.com. Use this promo code called TRANSFORM14, and you have 14 days free access to all of the videos. Um, if you want to download this, uh, I actually have a link for you. Let me just ask you guys out loud, what's one thing you can think about? Actually, I'm going to have you do it quietly. Write down one thing that you took from this that you commit to trying. 
one thing that you absolutely commit to trying that you've learned today as an individual? All right, shout them out. Let's hear some of them. Yes. It's all about delivering value. Yes. I just like that it's not big bang, it's small increments. Small increments. Yep. And honestly, I, I was inspired today earlier when they said, you know, normally we've always said HR needs to have a seat at the table. But today, actually, I learned something, which is why not lead the transformation? I mean, everything we're talking about is an organizational transformation. Why not lead the transformation? Why not facilitate these strategy sessions that we talk about? Why not um, take this to the next level and be at the forefront? You know, be strategic, not be reactive. So um, I hope you got value from this session. Uh, here's a place where you can download the slides. Obviously, we have Agile for training, um, Agile training for HR, and we have organizational assessments and all of that. If you guys need any help with that, let us know. But thank you for your time. I very much appreciate it. Thank you.